Well, hello again. It's Bruce Williams, and today I'm going to provide the last installment in my series on the selected gross pathology of North American mammals, in which I get to talk about a couple of conditions that are fairly widespread. They're not infectious in nature, and so they didn't get into any of the previous lectures. But before we do that, I want to thank all of my friends and colleagues one more time who provided me all these fantastic images. Our first image is from Dr. Martha Delaney, and it is a section of the spinal column from a black bear. And you can see that one of the vertebral disc spaces is compressed, it appears a little hollowed out, and there is extrusion of disc material into the overlying spinal canal, compressing the spinal cord. The amount of hemorrhage in this area suggests that this is traumatic in nature and very likely resulted from a collision between this animal and one of our automobiles, which is a very common and, and tragic occurrence for any type of animal. Don't forget that we see a lot of disc disease and other forms of aging disease in North American wildlife mammals kept in zoos where they live a much longer time and we see a much higher incidence of osteoarthritis and related conditions that we see in our wild animals. It would be very unusual to see a uh, prolapsed disc or even a very old black bear uh, coming in from the wild. Um, sometimes you even get to see the effects of medical management of osteoarthritis uh, in zoo collections in the form of renal papillary necrosis due to chronic administration of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or maybe uh, uh, changes in various organs due to steroid administration. Here's a spleen from a raccoon that has a very deep crease in it and, and after the domestic cats, raccoons probably have the funkiest uh, spleens out there. It's not uncommon to see these creases or little forked areas or whatever. It's perfectly normal for the species, so uh, there hasn't been any trauma to this. So a perfectly normal raccoon spleen. If you see a lot of raccoons, expect some really odd looking spleens. Uh, this is a picture of a heart. It's from a white-tailed deer fawn, and there is a hole between the atria. This is an atrial septal defect, and rather than get into an extensive pathogenetic discussion about the effects of this, this just reminds me to say that uh, uh, congenital defects are, are probably as common as they are in, in any other species. Uh, there's not a whole lot of information uh, on them. But I will say that if I had to pick one group of animals that seems to have more congenital abnormalities, almost as many as all the others combined, it's going to be your South American camellids. It's truly not North American animals, but we certainly see so many of them. And they seem to have more congenital problems than all the others put together. I, I once sat through a wonderful lecture by Dr. Tofik Abileo from Colorado State University who knows a lot about these. And in a two-hour lecture, it seemed the first hour and a half was just congenital abnormalities. So you will see them. And as I always say, if you see one, look for more because congenital developmental abnormalities come as a constellation of changes. Rarely do you see one lonely developmental abnormality. Here is a, a picture. This is from the 2015 Wednesday Slide Conference. This is an adult white-tailed deer. And there's about 90% about of this animal is allopectic or hairless. And there are some crusts on his body. And this is a disease that has been reported in white-tailed deer. It is a form of follicular dysplasia. It goes by the name of toothpaste hair disease, and I'm not sure how it got that name, but it's a true follicular dysplasia. Histologically, you can see that the follicles are dilated. They have abnormal 
layering to them. They often have no hair shafts and are widely dilated with, uh, uh, with keratin debris. And this occurs all over the body, um, unlike some of the follicular dystrophies in dogs, uh, which may uh, affect hairs of one color or another. It's sort of a diffuse change in these white-tailed deer. Obviously, without a hair coat, they're more predisposed to bacterial skin infections, dermatophilosis, etc., etc. Here is the stomach of a skunk. We are looking at the pylorus here, and you can see that there are multiple gastric ulcers. Mustelids do ulcers like absolutely no other species. They're very or family. They, they are very common in domestic ferrets that are affected with a wide range of other diseases. Uh, you can see them in animals in captivity. I had the opportunity to work with sea otters, which so few people get to do in their career um, when I was uh, working at the Valdez oil spill. And as we would post these sea otters who had spent time in the, uh, the rehabilitation centers, they, they 201 all had significant gastric ulceration because of the stress and the concurrent disease. So uh, gastric ulcers are not restricted to mustelids. Certainly you will see them in a wide range of species in captivity and in stressful conditions. So gastric ulceration usually uh, in, in mustelids, the stomach contains um, what on initial opening looks like coffee grounds. And if you wash those out, you will see um, punctate to larger ulcers, primarily within the pyloric stomach. That's where you want to look for, at least in, uh, in mustelids. Another mustelid thing, a very common mustelid thing, which is a nonspecific finding here, or to make, is hepatic lipidosis. Mustelids, like no other family of animals, uh, um, they have the ability to mobilize peripheral fat. They have to, because of their meta metabolism, they have to eat, uh, you know, three or four times a day. And if they miss a meal, they immediately start mobilizing fat, and it floods the liver. Um, but this is a very common incidental finding. They do not have a true syndrome of hepatic lipidosis, uh, such as we will see in sick cats or, or uh, sheep with pregnancy toxemia. This is always secondary, and if you, uh, if you can uh, take care of the, the inciting cause um, that is keeping them from eating properly, this usually goes away. Here's an incidental finding. I've never personally uh, seen one, uh, but this is a white-tailed deer, and you can see the singe marks here from uh, uh, a lightning strike. Here's a picture that was initially in, uh, uh, in Noah's archive. It is now in uh, uh, Dr. Terrio's book because um, it came from the University of Georgia, and I think that, uh, I'm not sure, but they obviously have, have license to use that, and because it's a Noah's Archive, I have a license to put it in this presentation. Um, this is what you would see, these, these areas of singed hair, tracks of singed hair, which, which is what you will see in individual cases where the lightning has contact with the animal, but remember the lightning strikes can also affect multiple animals if they are sitting on wet or marshy ground or standing on uh, wet ground when there is a lightning strike very close by where they will not all have or any of them have these particular lesions. So uh, lightning strike in a white-tailed deer. I, I have heard that if you get to them uh, quickly, you can smell the singed hair in the area. Here's a great picture that was published in VetPath from an article by Kevin Keel a number of years ago. Um, once again, in a white-tailed deer, and instead of the, uh, uh, the proper horn formation here, you have two low, very 
uh, abnormally formed antlers. And, and this is what is seen. These are known as antleromas. And you can see them in white-tailed deer associated with some alteration in circulating testosterone levels. Um, it may be the result of hypogonadism or cryptorchidism or castration or various endocrine disrupting agents. Um, but these have been known to be invasive as well, uh, causing uh, infiltration of the bone and even into the cranial cavity. So you can see the tremendous disfiguration of this animal with an antleroma. Here is a great picture by Dr. Gordon Andrews um, from the kidney and the ureter of an Asian small clawed otter. And otters, as a general rule, have some significant issues with uh, various types of nephroliths. Um, it's probably uh, most well developed in uh, uh, Asian small clawed otters where up to 90% in some studies have shown that uh, they develop uh, ammonium urate nephroliths. But they're common in a wide range of otters with our common North American freshwater otters having a, an incidence of 15 to 20%. So urolithiasis, specifically nephrolithiasis, probably dietary in nature um, because we see it so commonly in captive Asian small clawed otters, one of the more commonly seen species in the uh, zoo. It probably has a significant dietary component, but it's probably also multifactorial as well. But otters and nephroliths, a very common connection. And my last picture, as I draw this series of lectures to a close, is a green polar bear. Now, uh, this particular polar bear is green because the hair of polar bears is hollow. And uh, trauma to the hair can result in penetration of the hollow hair shaft, which will allow algae often from the environment, the pool that the animal has access to, to get into that hollow hair and to grow, giving the animal a greenish discoloration. Not all polar bears are stark white. This hollow hair reflects light interestingly. So you can see them sort of in a range of uh, shades of, of white to gray to blue, um, but the green ones generally are the result of algae growth within the pelage. And that is the end of this particular lecture and the series of lecture. Uh, I do enjoy bringing out these old pictures that I haven't seen in, in a number of years and share them with, sharing them with you. And I hope that you've enjoyed it and you might have learned one or two things along the way. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, as always, I wish you good luck, good health, great happiness, and please be safe. I'll see you another time.